Welcome back to Engineering Mechanics EGM 3512. Now we are in the third part of the lecture. Now that we passed the second exam and we are ready to wrap up the semester with some cool down. Now let's introduce the next topic, which is actually called truss structures. And some of you may have heard of trusses before. Some of you have not. So let's first give a general overview. It's easiest to see in this top picture on the left that we have a truss system here, which is similar to the roof structure we had before, except now we have a bottom cord here and then we also have these other members that pretty much create a truss structure. And you can see similar things in all the other pictures here on the right side, the Eiffel Tower, it's a very fancy truss structure. It's actually truss and truss and truss. Um, and I will give you a more clear overview on the next slide. But here you see that we have in a general sense a big truss system here, but also within the individual members for structures like stages and party tents and stuff like that you actually use truss systems because the benefit is that you need very little amount of material to span long distance. You see, this is a very long span and that can only be achieved on lightweight with a truss system. So let me zoom in a little bit. And so let's actually draw on there that we have a truss here. So you see, like when I ask students usually, they always say trusses are triangular systems and that is somewhat true but it's not the whole truth but you see that each individual component here also has trusses built inside so and that's a 3d truss it's actually like 90 degree flopped so if i pick another element there's something here and here and then there's also something here on the top it's difficult for me to show that in this picture but you get the idea that we have a big truss system and then we also have the small truss system in between. So, and the same is true for all these other structures here. The Eiffel Tower, for example, has a very fine truss system within each of these members, but then these members make another truss system and then the whole thing is truss after truss after truss. And here, on the bridge on the bottom right, we also have a very clear truss system and you can see that there's actually holes in these systems. So this is effectively also a truss, but it's more like a beam that has material removed to save weight. And the trick here for this truss system is probably clearest if we look at this bridge. Remember that we have a smiling beam if the truss, if the train drives over this bridge here then this part wants this part wants to move down and remember that we said if the beam is smiling then we have tension on the bottom compression on the top and so the trick in these truss systems is really that the bottom cord and the top cord are very far removed from each other because if you do that then you actually have an effective very long lever arm between those two, right? So you have compression on the bottom and tension on the top and um, everything in between just provides space. So that is kind of the idea behind a truss and trusses come in many different forms. So there is also fancy names for them. That's not the part here of the lecture. And of course, we're not gonna start with like very complicated cases first, but a system like this one here, the king post and the queen post, those are systems we will clearly be able to identify when we're done with this lecture. And let me just tell you that there are two methods to deal with these types of trusses, at least in engineering mechanics. That is the method of joints. and the method of sections. And in today's lecture, we will really only focus on 
the method of joints and I will explain in a second why it's even called method of joints and the method of sections is something we're going to deal with in a following lecture. So two topics we will really discuss. Both of them are meant to analyze the forces within truss systems so we can design them later on. Um, but today we only focus on the method of joints and method of sections will follow later. So that takes us right into our lecture 20. And so let's look at that. What are our topics today? As I said before, we only focus on the method of joints for now. And before we can follow any methods, of course, we have to introduce truss structures in general. I kind of did that already, but I will give you a more analytic definition in a second. Then we want to understand the necessary boundary conditions that we have to deal with in this class so that we can actually idealize truss systems because we can only deal with idealized systems here in mechanics and therefore we need to understand the boundary conditions. Then we will use our force equilibrium to determine the member forces. So each member, each leg of those triangles is considered a member and we will talk about those and how do we calculate that. And then ultimately we will use the method of joints to really determine the member forces. So let's get started and let's first draw actually a truss as we would see it in engineering mechanics. So for example, a very simple truss structure could look like this. And I'm actually making my life easier here by using these hinges. I will talk about that more in a second. But this could be your simple truss structure. And I just pretend that I have a simply supported truss structure that is externally no different than what we've talked about before. And usually what we do is we go around and name these nodes. So we have node A, node B, node C, node D, and node E. And those are called nodes, right? So which I idealized with a hinge. So those are nodes or also joints. And you see that's obviously what we're focusing on when we talk about the method of joints. We also have the actual members. This is between each node or between each joint. So these are the members. And then we also have forces that apply to the system. But I need to be very specific about this. What you will see in this class is different than what you see in real life. So you will only see forces actually acting at the nodes. So in this class, forces only act at node or joint. And in a second, that will become clear why that is important for us. It's actually one of the boundary conditions we need to understand for analyzing structures in this class. So we're kind of making an assumption here and that is twofold. Number one, members are only connected at joints and they are connected via a hinge, which sometimes you don't see that. Sometimes the picture doesn't include these circles that I included here. But whenever you have these triangles come together, it's effectively a hinge there. And then assumption two would state that forces only apply at nodes or joint. So 
And these two assumptions will make it easy for us to actually analyze those systems because I just gonna take one node out of the system. So let's say I will take node E here. I'm just gonna release this as I always do in mechanics. I'm just gonna go through it and release this node or this joint. And so if I were to draw that, I believe I would end up with a picture that looks something like the following. And of course I have my hinge here. And I cannot forget my external force, of course. So there's F. And then I would have released member forces. So for example, I released A, E here right ae comes from node a to node e and so this is this one and then i also have be and de so let's include that be and de and since i cut them here i now have the node just individualized and if i remind you if of what we have done in the previous part of mechanics. We always use the reference fiber and I could use a reference fiber here as well. So each member would end up having a reference fiber and keep in mind, we're doing this reverse, right? Usually people learn this first, the truss structure and then do the internal forces. But for you in this class, it will be easy to understand how to run these numbers for trust structures because you already have the knowledge for internal forces. So remember that the internal forces that we release are always as follows. We have a moment, we have a shear force and we have a normal force. And this is true for each of these members. And of course I would have to use my correct definition. So here for example is the left cut. So that means the shear force would go up. But now let's look at our conditions, right? Our, or our assumptions. We said that we have only connection at the joints via hinge and then that forces only act at the joints. So let me elaborate on that for a second. So if I were to have a truss structure that looks like this, And so far it looks the same as my structure above. But now I include a very important difference and that is I put a force in the middle of the member. And if I were to do that, you remember from your previous knowledge about engineering mechanics that this force here will now put this member into bending. But if I apply forces only at the nodes, then there's zero bending here. Right? And if I have zero bending, then I also have zero shear forces. So what does that mean for my picture down here? That means that I can now eliminate the moment and the shear force. So moment is equal to zero and shear force is equal to zero. And that is true everywhere, right? So I say that again, moment is equal to zero, shear force is equal to zero, moment is equal to zero, and shear force is equal to zero. And the only reason that is true, and this is important to understand or crucial to understand in this context, is because there are no vertical or perpendicular forces to the member anywhere. Similarly, you wouldn't see a force on the system like here or like here. Any of those forces wouldn't apply. So in engineering mechanics, we do not do this. This happens in real life, but here in this class, we are not doing that because it will stop us from actually getting into the method of joints and understanding what's going on. Because if we use the method of joints with this assumption that the forces only act at the joints, then the only thing we really have to deal with are normal forces, right? So normal forces have a value and you have actually calculated systems before where you dealt with only normal forces. And just for your understanding, I'm going to redraw this structure one more time as we would deal with it 
in the method of joints. So let's just redraw that entire joint E. And this time I skip the reference fiber because the reference fiber is not needed anymore because I only deal with normal forces and normal forces always are assumed initially to pull away from the node. So tension, remember that tension is positive, right? And of course, for equilibrium reasons, that cannot be the case that they always in tension, but that will be part of our actual analysis of the method of joints. But now I have effective, effectively F, D, E, F, B, E, and F, A, E. And those forces I would have to calculate for a node. In this particular case, I cannot do that yet because we're just talking about the concept. Um, and the reason is here because I release really three nodes, uh, three forces, right? One, two, three. I release those three forces and I only have actually two equations that I can deal with to solve these problems. So I have the sum of the forces in X being equal to zero and the sum of the forces in Y being equal to zero. So you see, we're taking a step back, right? So for now, we're not using the moment. And so therefore, we only have two equations because it's a 2D system. So in 2D truss systems, we can only find two unknowns at a time. And the reason for that is that I only have these two equations, but I will elaborate more on that as we move along. For now, it's important that we make the jump from internal forces here to only normal forces. And the reason for that is this condition that we only have forces at the joints. That means that the moment goes to zero, the shear force goes to zero. And that is something very pleasant because we have dealt with this actually before in this class, the sum of the forces in X being equal to zero and the sum of the forces in Y being equal to zero and only finding forces along a member axis. If you remember this, we did this when we calculated cable structures and the only difference between cable structures and truss systems is that trusses can actually be in compression. So keep that in mind trusses can carry compression forces or compressive forces. So therefore I can now find N with positive or negative results. And that is different from our cable structures we had before. The difference here is that we will now have to differentiate between tension or compression. And we have to talk more about that as we solve these problems. And before we solve these problems, let's take a look at the actual representation of the results. So my goal here is not for you to um, get to the point where you understand all of that that's happening right now that will come in five minutes or so right now i just want you to understand that the thing on the left side here is usually given so that is the problem statement and your final result is what you see here on the right side so this is the proper representation of the final result so solve for final representation So let's look at what's part of the final representation. So the first thing we observe is that we have this triangular assembled structure here and we have a roller at A and a pin at C. And if you take a look at the picture on the right side, you see that 
those external forces are shown as external forces. Right? So they are given here with the right values already. It's already been solved for you. And the problem here is not about numerical values here. We will do that in just a second. Right now, we just want to understand how we show our results. So let's take a look at, for example, node A. So if I take a look at node A, I can effectively release it right, by cutting this node. And when I do that, I actually end up with this part. And what you see is that the 600 is actually pushing on the node. So that would actually put it in compression, but it's a support reaction, so we don't worry about this. But the 450 here is pulling away from the node. And so this is a tensile force. The 750 is pushing on the node A, and therefore it's a compressive force. And if you already pay close attention to what happens on the other side of this cut here, you see that the tension is already given here and the compression is given here. So now we can follow our logic and actually look on the other end of the node. So for example, let's take a look at node D. So I release that node here. And what we observe is that the 450 Newton that we calculated maybe here also must be acting here at node D, right? And now comes the last part in which I have to release the inner component. So that is the actual member. So we have the node on the outside. So here I have node A, here I have node D, and the actual member on the inside. And often students struggle with understanding in which direction these arrows have to point, but let's look at it. So if you have the tension on the node here with 450, then here you have to, of course, also pull away with 450. So this member here is in tension, and this node is in tension, and this node is in tension. So don't get confused by the direction of the arrow in like the global sense. Just look at the local components. So the node here, intention, the member, intention. Node, intention, member, intention. And you can use that to move your way around. So like the things you have to identify is, is it pulling away from the node or is it pushing on the node? And if it's pushing on the node, it's a compression member. So I have to show that. If it's pulling, it's a tension member. I have to show that. And then I also have to include the numerical results. Sometimes you would actually see it only given once. So for example, here the compression member would have 750 there. And then sometimes people write it as compression. And then here for 50 and people would write it in tension. That's another way of showing that. But in a bigger picture sense, the goal for you is to draw this picture at the very end to show how the forces act in each member and to identify clearly if it's in compression or in tension. And if it's an external force, either an external force acting on the system or a support reaction that must be included in the system. All right, now that we know how, where we want to go, let's look at the actual process of the method of joints. So we're now dealing with the method of joints and I'm just going to conceptually write down for you what you need to do. So in the very first step, you can see that in the picture on the left, there are no support reactions, but the very first thing you need to actually find your way around the structure is the external support reactions. So first thing, is to find external forces. And that translates to support reactions. And I would say find all of them, but in some cases you get away without finding all of them. Um, for a beginner, it's always a good idea to look at all of them first. And now let's think about this, right? So we already talked about the fact that the trusses act like cable structures, except that they also can be in compression. And if you think back to 2D cable structures, I'm going to make a side note here. So 2D cables. Remember, as we said before, we had the sum of the forces in X and the sum of the forces in Y that we could use 
to solve this. And this is similar here. And remember that for the cables, we could only solve for two unknowns at a time. And this is true for the method of joints as well. So let's take a look at the structure here. So if I cut node A, if I release node A or joint A, if I release joint A, then I release one, two member forces. If I cut through node C, I release this one and this one, and I have two unknown forces if I have my support reactions. However, if I release node B, then I cut through one, two, three, and I cannot solve that because I have two equations with three unknowns, impossible. Same is true here at node D, so I cut through one, two, three, I could not solve this. So my second step is to identify first node, second, identify first joint at which two and only two unknowns need to be identified. So no more than that. Of course, you can have less than two, but that would uh, very rarely be the case. So now in this third step, after you found that node, you release the node, third, release that joint or node and draw its free body diagram, free body diagram. So I'll do that conceptually here real quick for node A. In our case, in our case, that would look like the following. I have this member, I have this member, and then I also have the support reaction. And the support reaction goes up. So and I'm going to call this here my free body diagram for node A. Right. And now in step 3A, you do an important assumption. So you assume that all members are in tension. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have member AD down here and AB up here. And if you assume them to be in tension, then it would look as follows. I use purple for that. So you have them to be in tension. And maybe you can already observe that this cannot result in equilibrium because I have a vertical component and a horizontal component due to these. And I also have the horizontal component in AD. And you can already see that ADX and ABX, let me point towards that. So ADX and ABX cannot be in equilibrium if they're both pulling to the right. Or vice versa, if you have a force going up and a force going up, they cannot be in equilibrium. So in fact, in this picture, it's probably the easiest to see that AB must point down. This is a given here, the support reaction, and AB is a variable that I assume to be in tension, which I always do, right? Remember this rule here, I always start with assuming intention, but then I so solve my equations. In fact, that is my next step. But if I solve these equations, then I will find that AB must be negative. So my fourth step is fourth use some of the forces in x and some of the forces in y to solve for all unknowns and we can do that like again this is only conceptually here but i'm not going to solve it here um, we'll do that in a actual problem in the next slide. But then in my fifth step, I have to 
use my answers or my solutions from the previous cut and translate results over to the next node. So I'm going to do that conceptually as well. So let's say I calculated AB. Let's take a look at the structure again. So let's say I calculated AB and I already know that I must flip this arrow around. So that means that I know what's going on here at AB, but AB is also acting at this node. So I can translate that result over to node B. Similarly, I know what's going on at AD from this cut, so I can bring that information over to here. And remember what we said earlier about node D, that if we would have cut immediately this node, we would have one, two, three unknowns, therefore it would be unsolvable. However, once I found AD, I can use that information here at node D, and then I can cut because then I have one, two unknowns left only. Again, something we solve in a problem on the next slide, but for the concept now, we use the results and translate them over to the next node. And then last but not least, the sixth step is use information at next node to solve next node with two unknowns at maximum. And so you can work your way through that and you see that all your following results will rely on your previous results. So it's a method that can quickly lead to issues. However, um, that is what you can do. And then you kind of repeat everything else, right? So repeat until, until all member forces are known. And once you're done with that, then your final step, so final step, is to draw the result sketch. And the result sketch you have seen above. So this is the result sketch here. This would always be the final step that you take and the final representation of your results and how to get there numerically, we will discuss in an actual hands-on problem with actual numbers and we will work our entire way through. But for now, we have concluded our entire procedure where we start and where we need to go. And how do we get there is by following these steps and by using your sum of the forces in X and sum of the forces in Y. And everything in between is just to make our life easier to use these equations and to move on with the knowledge that we created through consecutively cutting our way through the system. And that is the procedure for the method of joints. So now that we learned the procedure for the method of joints, we can initiate our first simple example. And here we have an example that asks us specifically to use the method of joints. That's very important later on when we understand also the other method, the method of sections, that we clearly differentiate which methods we're using. And particularly here we ask to find all the member forces. And let's take a look at the structure first. We have pretty much the simplest truss system that we can ever think of. First of all, it's a single triangle with a 45 degree angle. And we have node A and C that are supported. And then node B is an independent one. So if you paid attention, in the previous section, then you know that we could technically start this problem without solving the support reactions, because if we cut node B up here, we only would have 
two unknowns and we could solve this. But since it's the first problem that we're solving, let's actually focus on the support reactions first and then move our way in so that we're following the official procedure that we developed before. So first of all, I have RAY here and I have RCY on the right side. And A also is a support that is pinned. Therefore, I have a support reaction as well. And instead of pointing it to the right side, I immediately point that to the left side. That is R, A, X. And I don't have to run any complicated calculations. I already know that that is equal to 500 simply because the external force is 500 here at node B and it has to balance here because that's the only thing that can balance my support reaction. So now I can calculate all my other support reactions. Let's just calculate RAY and RCY. So to calculate RAY, I need to take the sum of the moments about point C to be equal to zero. And as always, counterclockwise positive. And zero is equal to, I start with my unknown, RAY. So RAY here turns about point C with a distance of two meters. So times two meters. And that is a clockwise rotation, therefore that's negative. Now I would think that I have to ex include the 500 support reaction, but its line of action passes through the point of C. So I don't have to worry about this. So the only other one I need to worry about is this one, which also happens to have a distance of two meters. So there's 500 Newton multiplied by two meters, and that turns clockwise. Therefore, it's also negative. And when I solve this, I find that RAY is equal to negative 500 Newton. And all that means is that we end up with 500 Newton downwards. So that makes perfect sense. In reality, RAY has to go downwards with 500. Because if the system is in balance, then here, this is the 500 Newton up here is rotating about this point. And the only thing that can put that back in balance is this 500. And they both happen to have the same lever arm, which is why the values are also identical to each other. So now simple enough, I can use, or I can find R C Y in this case, by using the sum of the forces in the y direction being equal to zero, and therefore RCY is equal to 500, plus 500 in the upwards direction. Why is that? Because the only vertical forces are these two, and they have to balance each other. Therefore, RCY must be opposite to RAY. So now I have all my support reactions and I can move on to following my method of joints. Now let's look at the system here and as I said before we can either release this node here on the top but then we wouldn't need our support reactions. So let's actually take advantage of the support reactions that we calculated so I can start with my node C. In this case I could have really started anywhere because any cut that I can possibly make right now would only include two unknowns. And remember that for the method of joints to work, we need to have a system with no more than two unknowns. And this is the case here for all of them, for all of the cuts. But I will simply start with node C, just because it gives us a good introduction into the problem. So the first thing I do is I cut joint C. And remember that the first thing I do is I draw a free body diagram. So let me draw the free body diagram of node C. So my node C looks like this. And I cannot forget my support reaction as well. So 
that was 500 upwards. And now in the second step of my method of joints, I need to assume a direction. Remember that we initially assume everything being in tension. So the node C here is in tension. So that means that AC would be pulling to the left and CB or BC, I should call it, BC is pulling to the upwards left. Of course, this cannot be in balance, right? So let's look at that. If this is pulling to the left and this is effectively also pulling to the left, that doesn't work. And it's probably already easy to see that this 500 here cannot be balanced by the vertical component in BC um, if BC is going up. So in all reality, my equation then would write as follows. Sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero, upwards positive, and zero is equal to, and now I'm gonna use a little sketch help here. I have a vertical component and a horizontal component, and the vertical component would be B, C, Y, and then here we would have B, C, X, and currently they both point in this direction, but we will soon learn that this is incorrect. So zero is equal to plus B, C, Y, plus 500, Newton. And if I rearrange this equation, then B, C, Y is equal to negative 500. And really what that means is that we have 500 Newton going downwards. And so now I have to correct my sketch here on the left to stay consistent. So I will erase this now. So my arrow direction actually is incorrect. And therefore, I have to flip it around. So let me start with the blue dashed line again. The first thing that I know is BCY is going down. And now by default, BCX needs to go to the right and BC actually needs to push on the node C. And now it's a 45 degree triangle. So therefore, it's very easy for me to understand what happens next. So. BCY is equal to BCX and therefore BCX is equal to uh, 500 as well. And that of course now is pointing to the right side. So now that I know that I can do one of two things. I can either calculate BC first, or I can set up the equation in the X direction. But I think it's better for us to calculate BC first. So because of the 45 degree angle, BC is equal to 500 times square root of two. So the square root of two is simply coming from a triangle that is one, one and square root of two, right? That's a 45 degree angle here. For those of you who have never seen that before, but ultimately that is what our result is. And that happens to be equal to 707 Newton. So that's actually a result. So therefore I can double underline this. So this is my BC. And now I can move on to the next one, which is AC. So how do I calculate AC? AC I calculate by the sum of the forces in the X direction being equal to zero. And zero is equal to minus AC plus BCX. And keep in mind, BCX is equal to 500. And therefore I know that AC is equal to positive 500 Newton in this case. And what that means is that we assumed the tension to be correct. So that's actually my last step I have to do now. So I have to say, hey, this here is in tension. And then my 707 is actually in compression.
and so far so good. This is definitely something we could have understood from just um, following the theory. But now the challenge is for somebody who has never dealt with these problems before, how do we translate this to the next node? And so I'm going to do that next. So I know what's going on at node C now. That means I can translate it to any other node. But for educational reasons, I go up to node B now. So let's cut node B. So maybe I'll do that here on the right side. So cut joint B and joint B looks as follows. We have a vertical member, we have the diagonal member and we have the horizontal force. And the horizontal force was equal to 500. And so we have B, C here, and we have A, B here. And remember, A, B is an unknown, so I assume this to be intention, but B, C, we already calculated before, right? So B, C is actually the 700 something, right? So I should zoom that in here. So we already calculated the value for BC and notice that here BC is pushing on the node and it is very common that students now think to push towards the node or like actually is going diagonal downwards so therefore my arrow here has to go diagonal downwards too but that is actually incorrect because keep in mind that this arrow here for joint C said or stated that this is in compression and if this node is in compression or if the entire member is in compression, then everything up here has to be in compression, including the node here on the top. So therefore, my BC actually has to push up, which on the first glance seems a little bit counterintuitive because it's exactly the opposite direction. But keep in mind that there's actually a member in between and the member in between, I'm just going to draw a part of it, would be this guy here. So it would actually be BC. And now that also needs to be in compression. So how do I show that that member is in compression? It's sh I show that like this. And so what I have effectively done is I have cut the member here and also here. And therefore I now can reason that my arrow up here has to point upwards. So that makes our life once again very easy because our system is so simple in this case. So I can include my components, which I also already calculated those. In fact, they are 500 and 500. And you will see in just a second that that makes perfect sense. So this here was BCX. And remember that BCX was effectively equal to 500 also b c y was equal to 500 but before we talk about the y direction let's look at the x direction and notice that this 500 here balances this 500 so let me write down that equation just for educational reasons in an exam or so i would never do that but i would clearly for the note c write down an equation that says sum of the forces in the x direction being equal to zero to the right positive and zero is equal to plus 500 minus b c x and so you see if i would have started at this node i would have gotten the same result right so if i would have started with joint b i would have found that b c x is equal to 500 and then I also would have found that BCY is equal to 500 because it's acting in the 45 degree triangle. And so now I probably don't have to tell you anymore how AB is calculated, but AB is just calculated by the sum of the forces in the Y. So I'm going to do that for educational reasons. Sum of the forces in Y is equal to zero and zero is equal to minus a b plus b c y once again that's 500 and so therefore i know that a b 
B is equal to plus 500, which in this case means that it's correct that it's going downwards. So what that really means is that this is intention. So I need to identify that. And by the way, up here, like for the previous one, we also would have found that BC is in compression. And remember here that, yeah, we wouldn't find a negative answer to this equation, but that's because here we already assumed the node to be in compression. So now I've calculated effectively all my forces, all three member forces. The last thing I need to do now is to draw it in a diagram. I'm going to do that here on the top. So on the top right, I will draw my system and I have, keep in mind, always the way that I show these cuts. So I have the corner here, the member and the other corner. And then I have to connect the corners and I have another member here. And now let's look at that together. I need to identify what is compression and tension. And I started with the node on the bottom right, node C. So I'm gonna also include my forces there first. So I found that AC is in tension. So AC is in tension, which means it's going in that direction. Whereas BC was in compression. So. That's how the very first result was. And now I can continue this logic. So I'm going to start with AC and I put this component in tension and I put this part in tension. And the way I show that is first the inner part, the member is in tension if I do it like this. And on the other side, it has to go like that. And the value we found was 500. So 500 Newton in tension. Now let's move on to BC. BC is the diagonal member and BC I found to be 707, right? Remember that from down here. So 707 and that was in compression already, but I can put 707 and I can already say it's in compression. But now I need to show my arrows in the right direction once again. Here it's pushing on the node, so here I have to be pushing on the node as well, and here I have to push towards the member inside. So the way to properly show that would be as follows. It looks a little bit strange the first time you see these arrows here, but it is correct. So now they are in compression. Last but not least, I have the vertical member, and that was also 500, but that was in tension, so I'm gonna put my number here first, 500 in tension. And if I know it's in tension, then it's pulling away from the nodes. And for the inner part, it's pulling away from the inner part or from the member, I should say. I probably shouldn't forget my support reactions or my external forces. I need to include those two, otherwise the system cannot be in equilibrium. So I have these two vertical support reaction, I have one horizontal support reaction and one vertical uh, horizontal external force. So this was 500 and then I had 500 here, 500 downwards and 500 upwards. And that is the complete diagram and this is really what you need to do. Of course the, comp the problems become a little bit more convoluted than just these three examples or the three members here, but this gets the point across very well for like a beginning problem. And I think with this, we now are able to solve method of joint problems. So now I will leave this next problem for you and for your groups to solve. This is a very interesting problem. Let me just give you an introduction to it. So there's a pin down here and a roller down here. And you see there's, you know, our triangles effectively. So I have a first triangle here. I have another triangle up here. And effectively I have a triangle here as well. And two external forces. So what would I do here? I would find my 
external forces, external forces first and then cut my way around the system and work my way in. But I leave this for you and your study group to practice and I will actually go ahead and solve this problem with you or for you. So let's look at it again as everywhere in this in this lecture we're dealing with the method of joints not the method of sections and now we are asked to find all the member forces and i will now show you how to do this we could technically start our way from the left to the right although we do have support reactions here on the right side we technically do not need to calculate these because this is acting like a cantilever system and i'll show you what i mean by that in a second but i probably have a support reaction that goes in this direction support reaction that goes in this direction and a support reaction that goes in that direction so i call this here r d x r d y and r c x and if you look at it so this here could be like one complete member and it would be a cantilever because it would be like fixed here on the side. And remember from our internal forces for rigid bodies that we always could work our way in towards the cantilever without even calcul calculating the support reaction. So this is kind of similar here. I can work my way from here all the way into the system. And then I can use my support reactions to actually understand if my, my answers are correct or not. So let's do that. So let us actually start by cutting the system at node A. So cut node A. And the way I do that is by copying my geometry first. And of course, geometry can be tricky with these problems sometimes because it's easy to overlook like a distance or a length, but here in this case, I have a three, three triangle, if I'm not mistaken. So let me include the 200 here. So this is 200. And once again, it's a 45 degree triangle that will make our life very easy in this case. But remember that I assume this being in tension but before I assume the other one to be in tension, I will actually solve this first. So I have R A, so, sorry, not R A Y, I have A F, A F, A F Y, and A F X. And you already see that if I use the sum of the forces in the y direction being equal to zero, then I will find that A F y must be equal to plus 200. So that means that AFX is equal to also plus 200. And now I know that my 200 here is actually pulling to the right. And the only thing that can balance this is AB here. So let me include that. AB and AB, of course, has to push in now. So I don't even assume it to be uh, pulling away from the node. I know that AB and AFX are equal to zero. And so therefore AB is equal to 200. So let me write that down. Sum of the forces in the X direction being equal to zero, positive to the right. Zero is equal to minus AB because it's going to the left plus a f x and a f x is equal to 200 and therefore a b is equal to plus 200 and now i know that one of them is in tension and one is in compression in fact the 200 is in compression and the other one a f i haven't even calculated yet so a f is equal to square root of 2 times 200 and that is in tension. And if I solve this, I will find that AF is actually equal to 
8 Newton in tension once again. All right, so I have my results at node A. Let's move on to either node B or node F. And if you pay closely attention, you see that I have now this member solved. So if I cut node B, I have one known, but one, two, three, four unknown, and therefore I cannot solve it. However, if I move up to node F, I have only two unknowns, which would be FE and FB. And so I can actually solve that. So let's move on to that node. Let me draw or let me write out what we're doing. So we're gonna cut node or joint F. And if I wanna draw that cut, it's gonna look like follows. I have the diagonal member, the horizontal member, and the other diagonal member. And I cannot forget about my external force. That's a very common mistake that like, or easy to overlook, I guess I should say. So I have a vertical force here, which is equal to 500 pounds, by the way. So I need to fix my Newtons. So let me fix that here. That's actually in pounds. but the concept stays the same. I also remember that my AF, so this here is AF, AF was in tension, if I'm not mistaken. So AF in tension means it's going downwards. And now I have to decide what I do, but to make my life easier, I'm gonna put in my components. So I have these components, of course they go to the left and they go down and I believe they were actually equal to 200 200 and then here also 200 but I also have other components now and I can almost do this visually now so I'm going to use a different color to make this very clear I have this vertical component and I have the horizontal component so the only thing that can happen now in the vertical direction that balances this 500 and this 200 down, which together they are 700, the only thing that can balance this is my vertical purple line here. So I don't even have to really write out my equations anymore, if I really understand this. I understand that this must be 700. So that is 700 due to the sum of the forces in y being equal to zero. And now I'm still dealing with a 45 degree triangle there. So the distance from here vertically down was three feet and then from here to the right was also three feet. So therefore I know that all my numbers here are also 700. So it's pushing in that direction. And the last thing that I know now is that it has to be in compression. And if I'm not mistaken, this member was called BF. BF and BF is equal to square root of two from the 45 degree triangle times 700. And that is equal to 989.9 pounds. So now I have calculated that component as well, but I'm lacking the horizontal component and I'm gonna use a different color for that one as well, just to differentiate that. So it's this guy, which now I'm gonna solve visually again. Be why can I do it visually? Because BF is pulling to the left and AFX is pulling to the left. So this component here, which would be EF, has to pull to the right. So let's do that. E, F. So this must be in tension, right? So E, F. So what is E, F equal to? E, F is equal to 700 plus 200. And this is already applied the sum of the forces in the X direction being equal to zero, right? So that's where that's coming from. So we know that E, F effectively is equal to 
plus 900 pounds and that is intention. So that is intention and by the way let me not forget that BF was in compression. All right so at this point it's probably best for me to start beginning with my sketch. So let me draw that sketch in a somewhat bigger fashion up here on the top right. So I have the horizontal member on the top. I have the horizontal member on the bottom. I have the diagonal members. And I have them in both directions. And then I have the vertical members. And of course I have support reactions, but before I do that, I include my external 500 and here we have 200. And now I'm gonna zoom in and erase the portions that I don't need for my diagram or like I'm pretty much erasing the cuts into the system. So I have a cut here and then I have ultimately cuts here. I have cuts right up here this node and this node and that node. And the ones that I already calculated are the ones on the far left. And I have to, of course, find my answers here. So AF was equal to 282. So AF was 282. Let me 282 and then the one on the bottom a b was equal to 200 and this was in compression and this was in tension by the way and in my note f i found that ef is equal to 900 so i'm gonna have to zoom in for that 900 and 900 was in tension And my other component was 989. So I'm going to call that 990. And that one was in compression. And before I move on now, I'm going to include again, if it's intentional compression with my errors. So 282 was intention. That means it has to go in this direction. So 280 in that direction. Compression is the other way around. This is all in compression now. And the 990 is also in compression. And last thing I can do here so far is the 900 being in tension. And that's all I got so far. So, but now I can use this to less to be less confused so next up i can either cut let's take a look at it i can either cut node e which is probably easier than node b and we will find something very specific about member eb in this case so but let's cut node e to look into that so i'm gonna tell myself to cut node E. And what I have, structurally speaking, is a system that looks like this. And you will see how simple this becomes in a second. And don't forget, the one that I calculated was this one, which was EF. EF, which was intention with 900. 900. And intention. And now let's look at the other two ones that we have. We have EB and we have ED. And there's a very important observation in this. This is very helpful for what we're going to talk about more in more detail next lecture. But this member here, 
is the only thing that acts uh, perpendicular to these two members which are in line with each other. So EF and ED are in line with each other and we have a third one joining them. So what that means is that if in this case these are perfectly horizontal or directly in the x direction and so the only thing in the y direction is EB because let's look again at the actual sketch of the problem. See that here at E there's nothing external, right? So there's no force. So what that means is the only thing acting in the vertical direction is EB. So if I were to write an equation for that, so the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero, then zero would be equal to plus minus EB and nothing else. And so therefore EB is equal to zero. And in fact, this is called a zero force member, right? So this is a zero force member. And if you have a little bit of practice, you could have seen that from the get-go because you will notice once again that here you have two parallel members that are jointed by a third one and that third one has no force at the external node, right? So it's an empty node that connects two parallel ones and a random third one. And so therefore, this must be a zero force member, right? So you must have this as a zero force member. So effectively, this thing is actually not there. And in fact, I will now erase that in my result sketch. So I can now remove this component here. It's not there. Believe it or not, these zero force members exist um, not only to confuse students, but in real life, they exist for like either construction stages or for relocation uh, of forces and for different force flow and uh, sometimes for redundancy. So, but they do exist and I challenge you to go out next time you see a structure and identify all the zero force members. But we'll talk more about them in the next lecture. Now, just as easy as it was to find the zero force member, we also know that ED must, equal, must be equal to 900 now, right? That's a consequence of nothing else being happening here and that those two are being parallel to each other. So I can say that the sum of the forces in X is equal to zero and therefore ED is also equal to 900 in tension. So this is not a big surprise. And in fact, if I zoom into my sketch here on the top, it's almost pointless now that we erase the vertical member to have these arrows here. So I'm gonna remove them and I will make them just one big long member, if you will. So let's look at that. So I really have only this. And now I know that everything up here must be 900. And here, this must therefore also be in tension. So I'm already done with that component now. So last but not least, I can either now focus on this node up here or on this node down here. And I think it's easier to start with this node. Well, actually it's not easier because we don't have the support reaction here. So let's move down to the node down here, which is actually node B. So no, notice that because I have calculated the, or I have kicked out the zero force member, now I have only two unknowns left. So I can do that, right? I already calculated these two. I eliminated the zero force member and now I can focus on these two. So let's look at that. Mm. And maybe for simplicity, I'm gonna use this spot here and I'm gonna cut node, cut, well, I'm using blue for that, cut node B, and node B looks as follows. I have the horizontal member, I have the first diagonal member, and I have the second diagonal member, the zero force member is gone, and the last one. And now I need to be careful because I need to bring over the values. So AB, AB was in compression with 200. 
So this here was 200. And then we have 990 also in compression. So 990 here. And now the question is what happens at the other ones. And I think instead of really going into big depths here, I'm gonna do it visually as well. So I have this component and this component. And by the way, that's also true for my other member here, this one and this one. And what I have now is easy to observe that no matter what this value is, I, I don't remember this right now, but I will look this up in a second, whatever this value is plus this 200 can only be balanced by this and this. And this here is the only thing that pushes down and whatever that is, it can only be balanced by this guy. So this is where I start. I start with the sum of the forces in the y direction. So I already know that my force here has to go up. And that member I need to look up is called BD. So BDY and BDX. And so BDY must be equal to must be equal to what was the other member? BF. So BFY. So now all I need to do is find BFY. Where did I calculate BFY? I did that right here. So that's 700. So I know that that is equal to 700. And now I can use that to also find BD. So BD now by default also must take on that value of square root times 700, which is equal to 990. And that is in tension. And so now I can focus on the horizontal direction. And to do that, I'm going to use a different color here. So I now have to decide if this is going to the left or to the right. But I can already see that BDX is pulling to the right, this one here is pulling to the right, and the 200 is pulling to the right. So I can 100% already know that my reaction here must be towards the node. So this is definitely in compression, but by how much we have to see now. So let's collect our values first up BDX, and I believe that was 700. And then we also had the horizontal component here, which that was also 700. And now I have 700 plus 700 plus 200. That means that now I am dealing here with 1,600 in compression. And now I solved effectively all my forces. So let's look at that. Let's go to our problem up here. So that was compression of 1,600, 1,600 compression and compression means pushing on the node, pushing on the node, pushing on the member. And my diagonal member was 990 in tension. So 990 in tension. Tension means pulling on the node, pulling on the member, pulling on the member, pulling on the node. And now if you paid attention, um, we have one more zero force member, which is exactly here. Why is that? Because BC and RCX are actually in line with each other. So you have a third one joining here, but there's no force that's pushing anywhere vertical relative to this direction. So therefore, CD must also be equal to zero. And so I can actually erase this here. So my system actually looks like this. And last but not least for full equilibrium, what I need to do is include my support reactions. So remember that I have a support reaction that's going in this direction and one that's going in that direction. And we also have one that's going up. And we can already tell that the one that's going up must be 700 because that's the external 
force equilibrium and then I can tell from this part here that I must have 1600 here and therefore this one also must be 1600. So 1600, 1600 and that is the complete solution and I leave it up to you now to go ahead and actually check this note for equilibrium. I, if I were you and I would practice this method of uh, joints, I would go ahead and draw out this note and check if these are in equilibrium. So there's a horizontal component here due to the diagonal component. This one is purely horizontal and then I have the 1600 here to balance that. And you will find that that will actually come out to be the same. So that concludes our problem. Let's take a look at all of it, what we've done. Please note that I sometimes took some shortcuts here based on the geometry. So it always goes a long way to draw a free body diagram. And remember, you have done this before when you calculated the, the tensile forces in cable structures. Now with trusses, you have the advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, that they also can be in compression. So you see compression members everywhere in the system because these are stiff members now, not like cables that cannot be com compressed. And the ultimate goal for all of these problems is to represent your results just like we did here. And I believe you now have all the tools to solve these problems. And I wish you good luck with that. But before I wish you good luck with that, let us take a look at our conclusion here. So please write down what you have learned and what your takeaways were. Where do you still need explanations and how do you get that clarification? And then let's go together through the entire lecture topic here. So let's remember that trusses are idealized structures here in mechanics and that we are dealing with hinged joints. So we have really hinged systems here and we connect those members. So I can check that off. I also know that only axial loads are really carried here, right? So axial loads is very important because that prevents shear forces from occurring and that also prevents moments from occurring. So therefore we're dealing only with normal forces, but we just call them axial forces in this case. In this case. And because we're dealing with axial forces, we can only deal with compression and tension in the members. So that needs to be clear as well. So please do not start to calculate moments or shear forces or anything similar to that. So then we also know how to cut each node, right? So we need to understand how to cut each node and then how to represent the member forces properly. So when we do that and we also um, do that for only two unknowns at a time, right? So two unknowns, no more can be solved. Please check that. That is because we have the sum of the forces in X and the sum of the forces in Y, which we are talking about here. So please be aware of that. And most um, important is that you can solve these member forces by using the equilibrium conditions and then also draw the proper representation of the results. And if you can all do all that, then you reach the goal of this lecture and all that's left for you is to practice your problems. Let's take a look at the practice problems. So here you see some of your homework problems and you see they are very straightforward uh, truss systems. So for example, here you have a truss system that consists of really uh, seven truss members, but it's also almost symmetric. Be careful because your load case is not symmetric, but it's a simply supported system and that should be easy for you to solve. Here we have a simple system which actually has some zero force members. In fact, you may want to check if some of these systems don't have zero force members, but you will, even if you don't see that when you calculate them, you will find that, for example, this member here is a zero force member. And I wish you good luck with like explaining that or with, um, you know, determining that calculation wise. And this is true for some of these structures, not for all of them, but overall, they all can be solved with the problems we talked about. And I wish you good luck with that. And I see you for the next lecture when we talk about the method of sections.